Uh, welcome to this webinar of the Royal Anthropological Institute with today's special guest, Professor Clive Gamble. This is a bit of housekeeping at the start to get you oriented. And for those of you who don't know the Royal Anthropological Institute yet, we are a UK-based learned society and we run weekly events and also conferences, symposiums and a film festival. We actually just finished uh, last week a 10-day uh, online film festival. If you'd like to support us in uh, going on with our events, please do consider becoming a fellow. There's many benefits to that. And my colleague Amanda is going to put a link in the chat, which leads you to more information. Uh, and uh, just a little heads up as well. I'm going to share some information with you here. Our next uh, big event is in October. It will be a major interdisciplinary conference on anthropology and conservation. And there will be a strong focus uh, on indigenous knowledge and indigenous rights. Our main co-organizer is the University of East Anglia's School of International Development. And we may have many other prestigious partners like the University of Kent's School of Anthropology and Conservation, the Forest People's Program, the Linnean Society, Royal Botanic Gardens Q, the Anthropology and Environment Society, Botanic Garden Conservation International, and the Society of Ethnobiology. So please do check it out on our website if you're interested in that. Uh, you can, um, from the 19th of April, you can submit a proposal for a paper. I'm going to hand over to our chair now, David Shankland. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Well, good afternoon for, for us here in London, but it might, of course, not be in the afternoon where you are, but never mind. Uh, a good whatever it is to all of you, wherever you are. And uh, it's um, really a wonderful day today that we can celebrate the launch of this book, Making Deep History by Clive Gamble. A topic of extraordinary importance because it helps us to understand how uh, modern anthropology and modern archaeology uh, came to be founded with the uh, 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 present uh, intellectual toolkit, if you like. And through Gamble's great work, we can see uh, how that actually began to uh, develop and the tools that came to be forged. Now, uh, the order of play today is um, that Clive will speak first uh, for um, uh, uh, to give uh, some summary of how the book uh, came to be and, 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 its, and its contents. And then we're very, very pleased to welcome Felix Driver, a leading historical uh, geographer from the University of Royal Holloway, who will make uh, some comments and then we'll move to generalized discussion. But just before we start, OUP, the publisher of this book, has sent a message which they would like me to read out. And of course, I'm very pleased to do so. So the editor, uh, Charlotte Loveridge, writes, we are thrilled to publish this work, which is a stellar combination of an extremely compelling topic beautiful writing and an author who it is no exaggeration to say is the UK's foremost archaeologist. The book itself is an astonishing human story behind this leap forward in science and our understanding of who we are as humans. We feel that it is fitting that this pivotal moment in humanity's self-understanding should be full of the trademarks of what makes us so special as humans, the people and the personalities involved, and their sheer endeavor and dedication as they overcame obstacles which would have thwarted so many. When we at OUP reviewed the proposal, it was clear just how extraordinary this book is. Our readers included self-professed, curmudgeonly, and meticulous critics who were converted to offer effusive praise. We are sure you will all agree. Well, uh, praise indeed, particularly from such a distinguished publisher, Although I wouldn't like to think that any any potential reader of a colleague's manuscript would be curmudgeonly, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they're not. But but, but uh, never mind. And also, um, I should say the price, if you would like to obtain it, it's twenty five pounds normally recommended publisher's price. But for those who attend the launch, you can obtain it for really the very very reasonable fee of seventeen pounds fifty. And you can see that uh, special offer if you go to the events page on our website and click through, and everything will be revealed. Just then, a few words about Professor Gamble. Uh, uh, he has been a leading archaeologist for a, a very, very great part of his career. 
he's um, also achieved uh, uh, wonderful things in his support of uh, associations and learned societies. He's been a trustee of the British Museum, a vice president of the Antiquaries, uh, a current president of the Prehistoric Society, whom we welcome to this seminar as well, uh, and also a former president of the Royal Anthropological Institute. And indeed, a great deal of this book is about the, about the interplay uh, between learned societies and wider aspects of British society. And so it's uh, all the more appropriate that our speaker should have profound experience of both. So that's enough from me then. I now would have liked to invite uh, Professor Gamble to give his paper and I shall disappear, I hope, into the background. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. There we go. Thank you very much, David, and uh, welcome to uh, everyone uh, at the uh, at this uh, launch. And uh, my thanks to the RAI for hosting this uh, book launch. And I think it's very appropriate because uh, the RAI is in its hundred and fiftieth year this year. It's an anniversary. And uh, two of the principles that I'm going to be talking about in this short seminar, uh, John Lubbock and John Evans, were of course two of the very earliest presidents. Uh, Lubbock was the original founding president and Evans followed him a couple of steps behind. So from the beginning, uh, the RAI has had this interest in the deep past uh, and in the um, exploration of interdisciplinarity between geology, ethnology, anthropology, and archaeology. So this is uh, my book with its subtitle of uh, Zeal, Perseverance, and the Time Revolution of 1859. And my starting point for this, it's always been an interest, uh, and I've always wanted to find out more about this particular event that gave us um, a time revolution in the same year as Darwin produced The Origin of Species. And the starting point really comes from Tom Troutman in this uh, seminal Merit Memorial Lecture 30 years ago to this uh, institute, in which he pointed out very forcefully that the uh, decisive event in the 1860s was not Darwinism, but the revolution in ethnological time. It was that moment when uh, the principles that I'll describe shortly uh, actually showed that we had a history that went well beyond uh, the Bible, well beyond uh, the king lists of Egypt, and way back into geological time. And this opened up a new vista. And as Tom argued, that a change in the scale of time necessitated a change in the content of history. And one of the reasons for writing this book was to find out not so much from the anthropological side, because Tom had covered much of that and others have uh, also, uh, such as George Stocking, but I wanted to actually look at it more in terms of how the archaeology fitted into this particular pattern. So that was my real reason for coming back to this topic and taking it through in more detail, because it seemed to me, certainly in the archaeological literature, that it had never been given the prominence that it actually deserved or the thorough examination which uh, it now had had. And it also raised for me a, a, another issue, which uh, I hope comes out uh, during the book, of different ways of looking at time of looking at time as a linear structure, of pushing things back and seeing timelines, and that particular Victorian interest in progress towards the present. And the alternative, which is much more an anthropological view of time, that time is folded, that the past rubs against the present. Uh, and I'll be saying a little bit of that, about that as, as we go through. In terms of the linear structure, of the time revolution. Uh, this is my chapter structure and it's extremely handy. It's very useful. It sets up for me a narrative arc where I can go from a day, which uh, was the discovery of the clinching proof about uh, uh, deep human antiquity through to a month when 
The evidence was presented a year when it was received, and then two bites at the decade when consolidation was then followed by acceptance. And then the century, which I do touch on in the book, which sort of brings us up to date about where we are now and which provides some of the breakthroughs that have happened since, like our understanding of quaternary geology uh, and also the scientific revolution in dating so that uh, we actually have ages now for some of the discoveries that they made. And this arc that goes through uh, is very much one that is powered uh, by uh, individuals and which leads to that. And uh, so in this particular um, uh, webin webinar, I'm just going to look at certain aspects. I'm not actually going to touch on the year or very much on the legacy a little bit towards the end. Uh, and I'm going to deal with those particular topics, but this gives you the chronological um, span. So should you buy the book, <laughs> um, th this is what uh, you can expect to find in it. Uh, that's the linear structure. The folding structure is something I picked up from Bruno Latour, uh, that uh, his statement that time is always folded, and he gives lots of examples about how this might be. And of course, he has that uh, wonderful uh, conversation with Sarah the, uh, about uh, folding handkerchiefs and so on, which is really very stimulating, but I won't go into that in any detail here, uh, but it, it's... Uh, uh, and in the book, I stick with the linear structure because it's just the um, most convenient way to get over the idea of what happens and, and, and what was involved. But within that, uh, there's all sorts of folding going on. And here is an example is uh, Joseph Prestwich, uh, this painting from a photograph uh, that hangs in the Geological Society was done in the year that he died, 1896. And in, in the year in which he received his knighthood, they just snuck his knighthood in before he passed on. And uh, here he is, the grand old man known as uh, one, of the, uh, one of those heroic geologists from the heroic age of geology. And uh, into him, you can fold all sorts of things. The fact that he was a wine merchant, so in goes the booze, uh, and all sorts of fossils like these uh, mammoths, which of course was essential for the argument in 1859 on human antiquity and other fossils coming out of the chalk, which take things back much further into his interests in the tertiary. Uh, and of course, we have to add in his wife who he married in 1770, uh, sorry, 1870, uh, and who was a very important player through her uncle, uh, Hugh Falconer, and uh, uh, she was one of the great witnesses and chroniclers of the time revolution. Uh, her experiences are folded into this. Uh, and uh, uh, his uh, remembrance, uh, this is the only public memorial to uh, Joseph Prestwich, which appears in Oxford, celebrates him for improving the poor drainage of New Botley. Um, on his house in London, there is a blue plaque, uh, but it's for E.H. Shepherd, the uh, illustrator of Winnie the Pooh, and not for one of the 19th century's greatest geologists, something that really needs to change. Uh, and uh, of course, the stone tools, this one given to him in Abvi in 1859, that brings together all these shallow and deep times, recent history, deep history and which is nicely encapsulated in this photograph. We're not sure what age it is, but it's probably the early 1860s of a conference of flints. And there is Prestwich uh, on the left holding a hand ax, one of these artifacts that they went to find. Uh, Morris from UCL is standing and two other members of the Clay Club uh, who were not particularly interested in human antiquity, but who good opinion about what they had found in 1859 mattered. So here we have this fusion of deep time, the artifact, shallow time, the Victorians sitting there, uh, and all sorts of little time motifs in Bruno Latour's um, uh, terminology going on at this in this particular image of time is always folded. It's rarely ever a nice linear progression, although uh, that certainly helps when trying to uh, tell a story and construct a narrative. Shallow time and deep time. 
And uh, uh, this was recent to me, just to bring the thing up to uh, uh, the most topical notion. Uh, just to give you some impression, this is from Rob Simmons, the, the meme of what's been going on in the Suez Canal, which also, of course, started to be built in 1859. It's a remarkable year. Uh, the first pickaxe went into the ground at that point. And there is the Paleolithic, uh, which is a huge presence in history. It's archeological deep history. And there in that tiny little digger trying to extract it from the sands of time uh, is uh, everything else. Uh, this is the sort of uh, 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 metaphorical balance that we have to strike. And of course, before 1859, uh, the ship never existed. And all we had was the digger on the desert. And so to the principles in this, uh, and uh, this uh, lovely diagram that was uh, drawn for me by Kaylee Pratsowski Wood, and I hope she's in the audience, so raise your hand, Kaylee. Um, and uh, this was uh, just to try and bring together some idea of uh, the principles, but also the folding that's going on. And at the heart of this is this circle of friendship between Prestwich at the top there, Evans on the left, and John Lubbock. And they're three very important uh, time revolutionaries. They're not the only ones. And in amongst there are the wives, sisters, families, and households that support them and often give them intellectual direction uh, as well as uh, the support that they needed in order to be able to pursue uh, these gentlemanly uh, science uh, at the weekend. Around them are all these uh, remarkable clubs and institutions. Some of them, like the Clay Club, has become something else. The Geological Society, of course, is still with us. The Ethnologicals is really where we are today, down at the bottom there, uh, with the Anthropological Institute, a phrase that the uh, founding president, John Lubbock, uh, disliked intensely. Um, because of its connotations with Hunt and all the other anthropologicals, but he uh, graciously took over uh, running it in 1871. And the other groups, and not to forget Boucher de Pert, who will meet in Advi, who was a gatekeeper to all uh, remarkable finds in the Somme, backed up, of course, by French scientists and geologists like Cabuto, Hébert, Gaudry, and uh, the very important person so all of these uh, various elements come together. It's like a, a group of spinning plates as Kate uh, drew it. Uh, and uh, uh, the job I saw as uh, author of the book is to kind of keep these plates in motion as they touch each other, as they spin off, and as, uh, as, as uh, time is folded and the story unfolds uh, within that, uh, uh, within that uh, narrative arc. Uh, that uh, for simplicity's sake uh, follows that linear progression. So that's just some of the areas that we need to be uh, aware of. And what that folds over into is uh, 1859 is an absolute gift of a year because of the books that got published. Uh, I, Dickens, of course, famously publishes uh, Tale of Two Cities. You know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Uh, uh, Wilkie Collins publishes uh, The Woman in White, uh, uh, Mill publishes On Liberty, and so on, and there's an important one that I'll come to later, and George Eliot publishes her first uh, big blockbuster, Adam Bede, which uh, John Lubbock, down here on the bottom left, had as one of his hundred most favourite books. And uh, Eliot, in her usual incisive way, uh, really, I think, sums up many of the uh, uh, time revolutionaries that we saw in that previous slide, uh, where uh, she puts it in a modern context, which is that the great work of the steam engine is to create leisure. Do not believe them. It only creates a vacuum for eager thought to rush in. And the eager thought is what we have from the Lubbocks, the Evanses, uh, the Prestwiches. And uh, uh, the second part of the quote, uh, that uh, people are now open to amusement, prone even to scientific theorizing and cursory peeps through microscopes. And there, 
Lubbock's desk uh, when he was writing about insects and so on uh, is a microscope. He was uh, the most ardent of cursory peeps into that. And of course, that microscope was originally bought for him by his father uh, on the insistence of Charles Darwin, uh, their neighbor uh, in, uh, in Kent. So that just gives you some idea of, uh, uh, of, of this background. And I was interested in the book of providing a context for these people to actually be working within and uh, 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 from. So what happens then the, uh, uh, with the time revolution? Well, of course, we all know about the mosaic creation. For those of you who don't know, mosaic is the adjective from Moses. So really the timeline as laid down in Genesis by adding up the ages of the prophets and the elders and so on. And by 1859, um, it wasn't really so much uh, saying that this was uh, going against theology. I think what, uh, what most upset people, particularly like um, Evans and uh, more so Prestwich, was that this was just simply bad geology. The phrases they use is that nobody would teach in school that the uh, uh, sun goes round the earth. So why should they teach that the world was created and humans were created in 6,000 years? It's just bad geology. And picking up on that, we have the, this famous quote, from Darwin, when he writes to Asa Gray in 1857, where he talks about this period of millions and millions of years of generations. And Hugh Falconer, uh, when he writes to his niece, Grace McCall, who later marries Prestwich, uh, three years before that, and Falconer and McCall are very devout. They, they retain their strong Christian faith throughout all of this, but they are determined to set the record in terms of bad geology. Uh, and uh, they talk as well, he, uh, Falconer talks as well, about millions and millions of years elapsing between the appearance of life on Earth and the present day. And here in this delightful diagram from Prestwich in 1857, the ground beneath us, we have this visual representation of deep history, of deep time, as the geologists understood it, and which, of course, the archaeologists are about to uh, uh, use. And uh, there at the top is uh, Clapham Town Hall, and underneath it uh, is the gravel, the drift. And it's that particular part of deep time from the geologist's perspective that they are going to investigate, and it's within that drift what today we would call the Pleistocene, the Quaternary, uh, is that's what uh, they were going to investigate, looking for evidence uh, which would push humans back into a geological timescale, back into deep heart time, and therefore open up the possibilities of deep history. And what I think they were seizing on as well uh, was Darwin's concept of unlimited time. It's in that same uh, seminal letter uh, to Asa Gray, uh, and it's, it, it, it's, he points out that in nature, geology shows us that changes have taken place and are taking place. We have almost unlimited time, and that no one but a practical geologist can fully appreciate this. It's that unlimited time that makes a mechanism of uh, uh, natural selection and descent with modification possible. And he could have had in mind these two as the practical geologists in that letter. Here's Joseph Prestwich, the older of the two, and John Evans. Prestwich, a wine merchant, very successful family business, uh, retires, eventually becomes professor in Oxford uh, and builds a large house just outside uh, Shoreham in, uh, in Kent. And John Evans, a paper magnate, much more makes his own way and is very much self-taught uh, with his first love of coins, but they meet uh, uh, as practical geologists because they appear on either side of a dispute about water in about the 1854, 1855, uh, and they strike up a bond and friendship and they, of course, are both uh, fellows of the uh, geograph uh, Geological uh, Society at that time. So those are the practical geologists. And uh, 
Uh, these two, though, again, a practical geologist in terms of Hugh Falconer bringing back to England because of ill health, his experience of working uh, in uh, India and uh, what is now Pakistan. And he was a great discoverer of fossils. He's the world's expert on uh, fossil elephants at this particular time. And his niece, uh, Grace McCall, uh, who he is uh, uh, extremely fond of, and who has suffered huge tragedy uh, in losing uh, both her child and her husband in the same year. And he suggests to her that they go to France on a trip uh, and that he will go on with her down into Italy. It's a, a real case of, uh, of uh, uh, revitalizing someone who's at their lowest ebb uh, and in 1858 uh, set off to Abvi because of this, uh, uh, because of, of uh, reports of what uh, Boucher de Pet has been finding there. So this is the map of where we are at that time. There's Evans at the top at Abbott's Langley in the paper mill. Prestwich on the left is investigating Brixham Cave, which uh, Falconer is also engaged with. And, there, and, and uh, um, uh, Darwin, of course, is the recluse in uh, Down House in Down. Um, and other sites have been found at this time. Uh, Hoxon was discovered in uh, 1797, pub in 1800 and forgotten about. We'll come back to that. Kent's Cavern was uh, discovered and stone tools were found with uh, uh, extinct animals, but the evidence was sat on by Buckland. Uh, Boucher de Pert in Abvi uh, started his work in 1841, but has been ignored by uh, the, inter uh, by the uh, learned societies of Paris. And over in Belgium, the Engis Caves near Liège, 1829, human material plus stone tools. And of course, the famous site at Neanderthal, another cave with its uh, fossil skull was found in 1856. One, slide, one site is missing from this map, and that's of course Gibraltar, where a fossil skull was found in 1848. So this is, though the, this is the crucible of where they were looking at this particular time. And so Grace and Hugh come to uh, Abvi uh, in uh, uh, November 1858, and they meet a Boucher de Pert, uh, who uh, is a retired uh, head of the customs, uh, a rich man uh, involved uh, in from his father as well. And this is the, uh, uh, the Hotel de Chepi, uh, the family home, which has become uh, the museum for his father's and his own collections. And Grace writes this wonderful account of meeting Boucher de Pert. And she talks about his wig of youthful brown curls and the fact that he has rouge on his cheeks, which uh, for a Scottish Presbyterian, I think uh, uh, didn't ring quite true. And then he shows them to the, uh, to the Flint Gallery where she freezes to death, uh, looking at all these hand axes and flint tools. And Boucher de Pert is terribly excited by every piece and takes them through every piece. Uh, and uh, as Prestwich recorded, uh, he was an antiquary distinguished by his various researches, his large and valuable collections, and by an indefatigable zeal and perseverance. And he has to have persevered because he's been ignored for so long. Uh, his fieldwork is really very good. Uh, there's a, a famous section he drew in 1845 showing where those gravel deposits he found uh, stone tools but he really hasn't uh, convinced uh, anybody. Uh, and the uh, uh, reason for that uh, is, um, is that, um, uh, first of all, he's asking people to accept the slides on the left there, the stone tools uh, as proxies for humans because he hasn't found any human remains. So these stone tools are the proxies for the missing humans. And uh, many people have commented what terrible illustrations they are. If you're trying to convince someone, this is not necessarily the best way to do it with these rather squiggly uh, shapes here. Uh, and uh, uh, the workmen, uh, interestingly, who he pays to collect these, they have their own, uh, their own name for them. They call them long de chat, uh, cat's tongues. 
which uh, exists, of course, as, a, as a, a, a wonderful French crunchy biscuit, ideal for dunking. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, I, I leave it to you to see how, how you derive a uh, stone tool here to a cat's tongue here, but that's what they were called. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what they remain so. Um, and the terrassiers, the quarrymen, are extremely important in the story as providing, uh, in Boucher de Pert's sense, absolute certainty in terms of testimony. They are to be believed. They are honest and they are to be believed. On the right, though, is another reason why he wasn't taken too seriously. In his great book on the um, uh, on, on his discoveries, uh, he published not only the stone tools, but he published these animal figures. And uh, he was taking uh, unmodified stones and uh, he, he saw that these had been selected by primeval man uh, as uh, examples of uh, uh, animals. So these on the right are all roe deer. He had about 20 categories of these horses, mammoths and so on. Uh, they're all just natural figured stones. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they are, uh, there's nothing about them. They're certainly not Marcel Duchamp's uh, piece trouvé or anything like that. Uh, that's still way, way in the future. And he would be very surprised to, to be uh, uh, confronted by that idea. No, these are just natural stones and I'm afraid they brought ridicule on it. But anyway, Prestwit, uh, Falconer and uh, Grace, uh, his niece, look at the stone tools and they are convinced and they write to Prestwich and encourage him to come uh, the next year and check out the evidence for himself. Because as, uh, uh, as Falconer says, because you Prestwich have great clenching authority. And so Prestwich the geologist who isn't convinced as yet by the evidence from Brixham Cave of the association between ancient animals and stone tools, he and Evans decide on a weekend visit to um, uh, the Somme. Uh, and uh, John Evans is escaping from uh, uh, all sorts of problems at work and having to become a single parent because his wife has recently died, uh, although he's, um, uh, uh, so he's full of uh, problems and cares and geo uh, geologizing will do me good. And this spirit of what binds geologists together, this camaraderie, as we saw in the photograph of the clay club at the beginning, looking at stone tools, just comes out time and time again. Uh, and uh, they come to uh, Abvi, they meet with uh, uh, Boucher de Pert, he takes them round, shows them the pits, the workmen show them the artifacts that they found that day, uh, but none of them are found in the section. They've all been found by the workmen previously, and this isn't what Prestwich wants. He is looking, he sets out a research design before he leaves England. He's looking for absolute proof, and absolute proof will come if he has uh, something that's in situ in the section. Uh, Boucher de Pet gives them a wonderful lunch during which a telegram arrives. And uh, uh, it comes from a uh, Charles Pinsard in uh, Amiens, who Prestwich saw the day before. And they quickly get on the train and go down to meet Pinsard because Pinsard has the evidence that they want an artifact in situ in those gravels, in the drift. Uh, this is the evidence they need. They arrive there and it's the afternoon of April the 27th. Uh, they're just outside uh, Amiens. This is Pinsard's map of the city. Uh, and uh, uh, there they are in, that, in the seminary. They arrive. Uh, Pinsard has arranged for a photographer and witnesses from the uh, uh, Société de Picardie, uh, the antiquaries from that society to come and witness this great moment. They get the workmen to stand there. Uh, first of all, Evans gets terribly excited because uh, uh, the workmen sell him a coin from the R Roman cemetery in the top of the gravels. So here is time being folded. And Evans is probably more excited by this, uh, this, this uh, coin than he is by the stone tool, which is the first time he's really seeing stone tools. There's 
Uckman pointing to it embedded deep in those gravels, they then take the camera and give us a close up of this artifact. And there it is poking out like a cat's tongue from amidst these higgledy piggledy gravels as uh, Murchison, the geologist was later to describe them. And this is the artifact that came out. I tracked it down in uh, uh, 2009 with the help of Rob Krasinski from the Natural History Museum. Uh, and uh, it was never published. <laughs> it was never drawn, which is uh, another story we might come on to in the uh, question and answer. Uh, but what they did do was write a little label on it. Uh, and uh, here it is stuck there by um, wonderful Victorian glue. And it says Santa Chol Amiens, 11 foot from the surface, April 27, 59. Uh, and that's probably written by uh, Prestwich's sister, Civil, who really organized his scientific work uh, back in London. And uh, in another hand, which I don't know quite whose it is, but I think it might be uh, Grace Prestwich, is written present when found JP Joseph Prestwich. And this was in Prestwich's collection, which went to the Natural History Museum following his death in 1896. There it is. Now, they come back to the country. That's the day, the discovery. Then the month presenting the evidence. They go to the learned societies. So they go to the um, Royal Society and Prestwich talks to them and they go to the Society of Antiquaries. Those are the two key societies. Convince them and everything else will follow. Evans is by far the hardest task because he's got to convince people that these are indeed stone artifacts. These are proxies for those missing human remains. But he's helped by this by two remarkable uh, uh, strokes of good luck. First of all, he's at the Society of Antiquaries in Somerset House, and he's looking in the glass cabinets there, which have all sorts of things, medieval crucifixes and so on, uh, not of Sir Hans Sloan, as is now the case in the British Museum. Uh, and he looks in there and he sees a hand axe, this one from Hoxon uh, on the bottom left, um, which is identical to those which uh, uh, about two weeks before he was uh, uh, retrieving in uh, the gravel pits of Amiens and Abvi with Prestwich, and which he only believed at that time existed in France and nowhere else. And there they are. No one knew anything about them, but with the help of uh, 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 Franks, one of the curators at the British Museum and a director of the antiquaries, they tracked it down to this letter that John Freer, a Suffolk landowner, wrote in 1797 talking about them. And that was perfect because here they were, uh, they were well described, the artifacts still existed, but what appealed to both Prestwich and Evans was that Freer was uh, a geologist uh, unfettered by theory. In other words, he dealt with facts, which is what they like to deal with rather than theories about the age of the earth or whatever it might be. And at the same time, Franks turned up this uh, artifact, which was found actually at the end of the um, uh, 17th century, uh, but was drawn first by John Bagford in 1715 and passed into the British Museum uh, from its then owner, uh, Hans Sloan, in 1753. These were really important finds because they demonstrated that the experiment could be repeated. And after that, they started finding uh, similar artifacts within the drift deposits of England. And within a couple of years, they were finding them in India and around the world. Following that, we move into the decade with consolidation. And it's at this moment that the time revolution starts to slip away from Falconer, from a Prestwick, from Evans, and moves into the A-listers with Lyle and Huxley. And it's really about those uh, human remains. And uh, uh, Huxley, of course, produces in uh, Man's Place in ne Nature, which uh, Darwin, of course, famously describes as the monkey book. Uh, and he produces the, the, the analysis of the skulls in which he gives us this uh, developmental sequence of Neanderthal in relation to an Australian and uh, uh, ancient skull, the one from Engis in Belgium, and then compares it to the chimpanzee 
uh, and the uh, Neanderthal and the European, hugely influential diagrams, uh, as we uh, 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 as we know, in terms of development and really putting the fossils into the record, which uh, none of the um, uh, others, the earlier ones who were dealing with the archaeology uh, did so, which led to also a big uh, spat about plagiarism between Falconer and Lyle. And within that, the context for this, and here we come back to folding, is very much, uh, this is developmental drawings, which have fascinated the uh, Victorians in mid-century. Uh, Huxley's famous drawing there, uh, which has been copied many times. Uh, this one from the Wellcome Institute uh, turns everything into something else. This is a, uh, a young woman being turned into a fish and back, but there are lots of examples in that same book of things changing uh, through time. Charles Bennett, these rather sinister images of what makes my ear so long, where a, a sage turns into a goose and also uh, into a barrel, uh, which eventually somehow becomes a dunce's hat. Quite remarkable. And then, of course, uh, um, to get in on the act, uh, we have uh, Charles Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, uh, doing a sort of earlier version of Huxley uh, with uh, uh, Reginald Southey uh, and the skeletons. And of course, uh, Alice in Wonderland, 1865, is just full of developmental situations. Alice drinking from which particular bottle grows and shrinks in due proportion. And then we move on to acceptance and uh, uh, the great texts here from the time revolutionary's point of view is uh, our first president, uh, John Lubbock, uh, and his prehistoric times in which he names the Paleolithic, the old Stone Age, uh, and, uh, uh, in, and which is followed in 1870 by the origin of civilization and the primitive condition of man, which uh, George Stocking wrote very eloquently about in terms of either tracing history up or tracing history back. After that date, uh, Lubbock enters Parliament, and although he keeps revising these books right through to his death in um, uh, 1913, he uh, doesn't uh, uh, really give any more substantial volumes. Evans sees his role as, as uh, documenting the ballast of deep history, and that is ancient stone implements. In 1872, he produces this monumental work uh, showing the variety and uh, links uh, of the stone tools uh, across. And by 1871, it's a done deal. As Darwin says in the beginning of The Descent of Man, the high antiquity of man has recently been demonstrated by labors of a host of eminent men, such as Evans and Lubbock. I shall therefore take this conclusion for granted. QED. Now, beyond that, though, uh, Darwin is hugely important, but as, uh, uh, but as Tom Troutman pointed out 30 years ago, it was this revolution in time that was most important. But also, I think, going through the books of that year, uh, this uh, coincidence that on the same day, November the 24th, we had published The Origin of Species, as well as Sam Smile's Self-Help. And those two books uh, 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 couldn't really give a greater, uh, more, more different view of what drives change. Darwin was about populations operating in unlimited time and evolution history would be blind in that sense. Um, you, you couldn't chart a route to the, of progress to the, to, to the present day. Whereas for smiles, oh dear me, populations didn't matter so much. It was individual lifetimes. You could go from a log cabin to the White House as long as you had character, as long as you had zeal and perseverance. And those six qualities of character that determined a successful businessman uh, very nicely uh, describe Lubbock, Evans, and uh, uh, Prestwich. They drove them. And it's those sorts of uh, uh, aspects of character which Lubbock would pick up on in later life. His book about the pleasures of life uh, are very much what they, how they would see the world and how they would see uh, history and they would see change uh, being effected. And behind that, I think, would be uh, much more 
a, a, a following uh, Spencer rather than Darwin with the law of all progress that we see uh, in Spencer's words that the evolution of the simple into the complex through successive differentiations holds throughout. Uh, and this would give a kind of direction to history that people like uh, Evans and Prestwich in particular and Lubbock as well would want to see in terms of, uh, of, of where this was all driving towards. Evans puts this, uh, I think, quite clearly in his famous uh, diagram from 1850 of the development of the British coinage, where he states uh, quite clearly that copying leads to subtle changes. And a later paper discusses this in terms of natural selection. But when it comes to looking at stone tools, these are fixed forms. They don't seem to lead anywhere. They are descriptions. Uh, and uh, yes, you can from here to more complex uh, societies and cultures and whatever, but he's not going to draw those particular items. He's just going to take it as read that it's part of that general law of uh, uh, moving within um, simple to complex frameworks. And that Darwinism as such really doesn't uh, figure uh, in that way. But uh, the self-made man with um, smiles is, is uh, all that's important. So to these uh, people interested in uh, zeal and perseverance, uh, what's interesting is uh, the, the one uh, uh, tweak that they make uh, at the beginning of all of this uh, process, when they're presenting evidence, when they're looking for the acceptance, is to present this in terms of an upward view. Uh, this was the artifact they found in 1859, the artifact of proof uh, associated with extinct animals. And the label clearly indicates which way they expect to see it uh, displayed. And there in uh, one of Civil uh, Prestwich's watercolors that went to the Royal Society for engraving, she also has them pointed down. But by the time it gets uh, published, those same artifacts have been reversed. And at time's arrow, that linear sequence, the pointy finger is now pointing upwards. This is the lesson uh, from uh, the deep history, uh, which is, uh, it may be a basement uh, of, of history, but it's pointing up in that direction. And upon that can then be hung all sorts of interests about race, ethnology, and uh, social evolution. And so finally, the grand uh, narrative of 1859, uh, the one that uh, I think uh, brings them together and brings uh, the uh, anthropologists like uh, Tyler uh, in with this, is the destination of history is the unity of humankind. There was a wonderful optimism about about this and Lubbockus, an educator, uh, felt this uh, extremely uh, strongly. Uh, Lubbock dies in 1913 and what stops all of this cheery optimism is of course the First World War and uh, the, 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 the deep history of what is going on there uh, takes a very different turn, a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a turn that we want to uh, suppress and forget about uh, rather than um, celebrate as, uh, 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 as, as, as Lubbock and uh, others uh, were doing. Uh, and uh, it changes quite dramatically at that point. And the grand narrative was abandoned by anthropologists and to some extent by archeologists as something they didn't feel happy with. And it's uh, interestingly been taken over uh, by uh, historians uh, such as uh, Big History, examines our past, explains our present, imagines our future. And this can be traced back uh, in, into the early uh, 20th century. And as Bill Gates uh, says here on the cover, big history provides a framework for understanding literally all of history ever. Well, you can't, uh, you can't argue with that, can you? Uh, and of course, the runaway bestseller by uh, Harari on uh, Sapiens. Uh, and of course, uh, Andrew Marr, everyone gets into the act here, apart from archeologists and, uh, and uh, anthropologists. So there maybe is a lesson uh, to learn here. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, Gordon Child, of course, would be one of those. And Graham Clark uh, in World Prehistory and New Outline uh, 
pointed out that prehistory isn't something that we escaped from, but is something that uh, is all around us. And of course, uh, there are uh, very um, notable exceptions from the anthropologists. And I, I had to mention uh, Ernest Gellner for David uh, with Plough, Sword and Book, which is just a wonderful uh, overview. And uh, we shouldn't forget too, Ashley Montague, who is fatigable in producing uh, great uh, positive statements uh, 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 where deep history uh, could take us and where we understand. But the field remains um, underexplored by those people who are actually uh, investigating it. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the, I, think, I think the fight back uh, is beginning. And I think it began uh, with um, uh, this uh, uh, book, Deep History, by Andrew Sharrock and uh, uh, Dan Smale, uh, in which um, uh, a number of anthropologists, historians, physical anthropologists and so were drawn together. And uh, Andrew and Dan uh, turned it into a continuous uh, prose. Uh, and uh, really did start to examine. And also within that, they examined why prehistory is, is uh, a bit of a drag on being able to get into these large narratives, and which is the reason that I've uh, dropped prehistory uh, from this, although I'm very proud to be the president of the Prehistoric Society, but that's another story uh, which you might like to carry on. But um, a deep history, I think, opens up just a huge uh, amount uh, for um, looking at uh, the groundings of our, our, our cultures and talking to an audience which is clearly there uh, in terms of uh, the audiences that the Hararis and the Mars of this world have tapped into using our information and turning it into um, uh, a rather progressive, uh, often environmentally deterministic view of how the world works. So my own book is really going back to that to try and clear some of the undergrowth uh, before moving in uh, to those sorts of deep history statements. So that brings me very much to the end and that prehistory now becomes a deep history and with revolutions come new grand narratives, that content of uh, a, a different time scale that is required and which is uh, needed. And so um, I think I will leave it there and I look forward to hearing what your comments and questions might be. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much for the absolutely wonderful overview. Um, as uh, my colleague Amanda says, you please do feel free to start pushing your questions in, into the chat. We can also take them live later on. Um, and uh, now we invite uh, 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 Felix Driver, uh, please, to, to take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, right. Uh, well, uh, can you hear me? OK. I hope yes, you... I can hear you fine. Please go Excellent. ahead. Excellent. Well, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure uh, to be uh, leading this response, uh, to be invited to comment on Clive's Look, I'm going to start with a short commentary and then I'm going to ask Clive a few questions uh, which he's not seen before uh, as a way of having a conversation around the book and then we'll open up to general questions which David will will share. So feel free to put your questions or comments in the, in the chat as we go. So the, the first thing I'd like to say is something about the author. Uh, it's pretty evident to those of you who know him that, that uh, this book could only have been written by, by Clive. It ranges very far and wide uh, and deep, of course, and it hops across disciplines uh, in a way that few of us could do. It, it reminds me really of, of why at Royal Holloway we were so delighted to have lured uh, Clive away from the fastness of Southampton archaeology for a mere seven years uh, from 2004. And uh, those of us who, who work with him remember Clive was equally at home talking with uh, the cultural geographers about performance or, or object biography or indeed Latour. Uh, as, and he was a, a, as at home as talking, as engaging in, in hefty scientific discussions about, about climate change uh, and about human evolution. So Clive's work is writing Bridges, uh, the Sciences and, and the Humanities. And, and in this book, particularly geology and archeology, span as we've heard uh, already, are, are very human disciplines. They're, they're made and they're remade 
in a world of human emotions, of love, of strife, as well as zeal and per perseverance, uh, which are in the subtitle of the book. And in the book, you'll find further gamble traits, uh, are much in evidence. Uh, you'll find a, an unbridled enthusiasm for, for thinking big, as we've just been hearing about, and a, a certain penchant for uh, a, a rather uh, wicked turns of phrase. Uh, and you know you're in for a treat in this book when you reach the very first line, which I'll read to you. The time revolution of 1859 rang to the sound of splintering stone. Full stop. As you've already seen, Clive's book has on the front cover uh, 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 John, John Linnell's painting of the Kensington gravel pits uh, from 1812. It's a beautifully produced book, incidentally, uh, and, and this graces the cover. It's a very appropriate choice, uh, uh, evoking the image of deep history, while at the same time foregrounding the workers, the gravel diggers. So here there are the terrassiers, uh, uh, discussed in Clive's book as, as vital sources of knowledge, of evidence, and indeed agents in their own right. And people perfectly capable of pulling the wool over the eyes of the most accomplished scientists. Let's say a little bit more about this painting. The art historian Tim Barringer calls the Kensington gravel pits Linnell's most radical depiction of labor, giving uh, a prominence to backbreaking work in a very unpicturesque uh, scene in what is now uh, Notting Hill on the edge of, of London as it was then. And it provides quite a contrast to Linnell's later works, which were the epitome of Victorian nostalgic pastoralism. This is a landscape under transformation by human labour. Indeed, Tim Barringer describes it as amongst the frankest representations of labour ever made, which is a rather extraordinary claim. Now these, I think, are reasons enough for having this painting as a cover of Clive's book, but I think there's another reason why the choice is telling, because landscape paintings such as these reflect a particular understanding of time, steeped in a vision of national progress through human labour. And in the course of the 19th century, this vision of progress, which is a kind of foil to some of uh, Clive's arguments, incidentally, as we've heard, this vision becomes steadily more imperial and more global. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, just to show that I did actually get beyond the cover, let me say something about the contents. As we've seen, Clive tells his story in a way which actually reworks time. He, he talked about uh, following time's arrow in, in a sort of linear way, but actually there's quite a lot of folding going on in this book because it works, the chapters work, they move sequentially through different scales. So you start with the scale of the day of this discovery and the lunch in the middle of it, which is wonderfully uh, told. You move to the month, you move to the year, and you move to then to the decade, which even Clive has to take in, in two chunks. And eventually you move to the long 19th century and, and reaching up to our own time, the legacy. So I think in approaching history this way, uh, Clive captures some of its more personal and human dimensions, particularly the lived history of the moment the relationships between individuals that he's mentioned today, uh, and then also generations and legacies and careers. And I think this overall, this approach makes for a, a very uh, human story. And throughout, there are uh, many examples of this. I'll just mention uh, two that are linked, uh, one of which he, he alluded to, uh, which are chance meetings. I think the Victorians were quite, quite fond of chance meetings, weren't they? But two of them Clive mentions, the first being the meeting of Evans and Presswich on a train to Richmond to consider that pressing question of, of, of water in Croydon, I think, in a legal case in 1854. And a second meeting he mentions is the meeting of Edward Tyler with Henry Christie on a tram in Havana in 1856. And around these chance happenings, Clive weaves his, his narrative. Now this scalar approach to time, where you go from the day to the year to the decade and so on, allows, allows Clive to cast his net much further than I think orthodox histories of archaeology or geology. Uh, and what I mean by that is that Clive, like many historians of science these days, contextualizes the work of scientists and its effects. Uh, and you can see a similar approaches in biographies of Darwin, for example. He pays attention to the intersection of the public and the private, uh, to the relationships between science and society, 
And, and there are plenty of discussions in this book of family relations, of geopolitics, of war, of the intersection of business and science. And these are wonderfully told in particular through the biographies of Evans and Presswich, who are indeed the Holmes and Watson of this story. Uh, Clive does actually uh, make that analogy at one point. On the grounds that I think Conan Doyle was born in 1859. Isn't that right, Clive? I think so. Um, so it is, yes, yes. It is, excellent. Um, so the, there are many other names, uh, Evans of Presswich get their due here, but many other names, uh, you, you, you read the book and you want to know more about. One I, I'm particularly interested in is Hugh Faulkner, the man who, as we heard, tipped off Evans and Presswich about the gravel pits of the Somme and what could be found there. Now Falk Faulkner, as Clive briefly mentioned in his talk, spent much of his career working in India for the East India Company as a botanist as well as a fossil hunter, which we heard about. Uh, Faulkner was a polymath working right across the human and physical sciences. And very recently, historian of science Pratik Chakrabarti has presented Faulkner as in fact the paradigm case, uh, a kind of exemplary case of the way that uh, geological writing was entangled with writing about antiquity. So I think we need to know more about Faulkner and in particular, we need to know more about his connections with empire. The history of empire is really never far away from some of these uh, discussions. Now that said, I think Clive's focus in, in, in the book in relation to inter international connections is on Europe. And actually, uh, this is a wonderful book to read in the wake of uh, the uh, calamity that was Brexit, because it shows us just how European Victorians could be, uh, revealing the best of the Victorians and sometimes their worst. Now here, I must mention one of the many finds uh, I've made in this book uh, before uh, coming to my questions to Clive. Uh, and this is uh, a word, the wonderful word, gobamush, uh, which was a term originally referring to an African bird, but became to be used metaphorically to describe a credulous or gullible person. And Clive uh, tells us uh, uh, that the, the word gobamouche was used by Roderick Murchison as a put down about Boucher de Pert and his supposed susceptibility to the Tiracio's fraudulent claims about archeological finds. Uh, it's really interesting here and, and, and ironic, of course, that the term imported from the French uh, combining words for swallow and for fly. So the, the word is sometimes translated as flycatcher. Uh, 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 it was then used as a way of uh, the English putting down uh, 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 the French uh, scientist. Um, it's a very apt word because so much of the argument that Clive's been talking about, about these 1859 discoveries, was about the credibility of scientific testimony, who was or wasn't a gobamouche. Now, I think we can agree that historians uh, have known much less about men such as Presswich, Evans and Faulkner uh, than we really should have, have done. Uh, and maybe the Murchisons, the Lyles, the, Huxley, the Huxleys and so on have held the field for too long. And I think Clive has made this case uh, very convincingly. But there again, Clive also ranges more widely than those individual figures and he has much to say about, about the better known names, and we've heard a little bit of that as well today, and their role in giving archeology span and geology some of their most basic terms. So this was new to me, Clive, maybe not to, to, to many of you, but from words like drift itself, or the Pleistocene, to the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, all of these words and concepts come out of uh, Clive's account of this moment and its predecessor moments and its legacies. Uh, in the 1860s and afterwards. So I think the sign of a good book is it, it prompts many questions and, and there are many here to ponder. So having said those few uh, thoughts, I'm going to now turn to Clive and pose some uh, questions which he is fully at liberty to answer or not as, as he may, may wish. And then we'll turn to questions from, from the floor. So I'm gonna move from the simple to the complex like Spencer uh, uh, or perhaps the apparently simple uh, so we'll start with some short ones uh, and then just a couple more involved ones. So first, uh, first of all, Clive, a, a question about expectations. And I'll start with a quote that you start with from John Lubbock at the start of the book, quote, what we see depends mainly on what we look for, unquote. So I'd like to ask you, what were your 
expectations as an author? What were you looking for? And was it in the end, having produced the book, the same as what you actually found? Uh, no, it wasn't. I, I thought I would be, um, I thought I would be limited to um, a, a much more, to, to quite a shallow description of what they could and couldn't do. Uh, and, and in fact, um, uh, you know, because I mean, remember my background, Felix, you know, I'm not a historian. So the thought of sitting and going through archives of letters and trying to decipher 19th century handwriting is just beyond me. Um, you know, I can deal with stone tools and animal bones, but, uh, but, but texts, no. So I never thought that I would be, be going, um, uh, be, be getting into any kind of level of detail, but what I hadn't uh, allowed for is the fact that uh, the world out there has been scanning everything. Uh, and so for somebody like me, as a uh, as an archaeologist uh, historian, it, it's just a, a, a godsend that you can get all these wonderful uh, uh, journals online. And the great thing about um, the principal actors is that they do provide very detailed descriptions of what they were doing and in some cases why they were doing it. So these are people who haven't had biographies. They've had uh, life letters, but they haven't had uh, biographies, uh, any, any of them, apart from Evans to some extent from his daughter. Uh, but, uh, but it's still possible to reconstruct quite a rich uh, impression of them from what they actually wrote themselves because it's been liberated by, uh, by, by, by the wonders of digital scanning. Yeah, well- so I mean, that did surprise me. Yeah, uh, certainly that is worth celebrating and certainly working with Q, I, I, I've come to appreciate the value of institutions like the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which has scanned uh, all sorts of resources relating to the history of, of botany and natural history but also of very great value to historians of all kinds. So uh, if you don't know it, audience, do go off and have a look at the Biodiversity Heritage Library website. It's absolutely amazing. So, so, so that's a very hopeful answer. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to other questions uh, later. I've got my second question is about um, timescales or more precisely the way you've structured the book. And I think, although you talked about this narrative of time uh, moving one way and you were interested in folds of time, Actually, your structure of going from a day to a month to a year and so on is not really linear. It, it is actually rather folded and, and rather clever. And I think it, I'd like to know whether you always conceived of the book in this way. That's one question. But relatedly, what difference do you think it would make if you wrote the book around, uh, instead of temporal scale, spatial scale, and you started off with the site uh, and worked out with that. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, that's a good question. I I think um, you're you're right. I mean, um, uh, it all does fold into e each other. And an earlier an earlier draft of the book, which um, mercifully some some very astute readers said this just won't work, had everything folded into everything else, and uh, the book was like a giant handkerchief. <laughs> uh, with everything rubbing against everything else, which allowed my um, predilection for coincidence to uh, run riot. And actually, it, it was just a, a huge mess. Um, but you're quite right. It does fold in, I, I, into it. Um, and that came out of actually of, of doing the research and then starting to write it and trying to work out what the best structure would be. And I didn't want to start the book you know, way back in, you know, the 1810 or something and go through and then suddenly um, we, we, we arrive in 1859. I wanted it to start in 1859 and then explain how they got there at that point. So yes, it, it was that. In terms of the spatial aspect, um, I, I think what I, I was, what I was kicking against there was I didn't want it to sound too archeological. <laughs> Um, and it would be very a very archaeological way to do it would be to start with the site and to build out to the region and then on to the world and then the universe and so on. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want I didn't want that particular uh, uh, nested a, a, a approach. Uh, I wanted to keep the 
principal characters front and center. And so the, in a sense, the landscape moves with them. And yes. I, I think that's one thing that really surprised me was I, I hadn't uh, appreciated until I sat down with this. I mean, this will come as no surprise to 19th century historians, but boy, did these guys travel. I mean, they, they were, I mean, they, you know, they made air mile look, uh, look pathetic. I mean, they were always on the train. They were always zooming off to look at something. Um, Evans gets back from uh, uh, the Somme the next day he's going off on a trip to Manchester and Belfast and just about gets back in time uh, to uh, be there for um, Prestwich's talk. You know, it's, it's uh, quite remarkable. Yes, it is. And it impresses us just at this particular moment, doesn't it? I'm going to, thank you, Clive. I'm going to skip over a question about Darwin and maybe we could come back to that later at this time. But in the interest of time, move on to one related to what you've been saying there about your archaeological self. Uh, possibly. Uh, but it's a question about proxies. Um, so, so much of your book is, is about the reliance uh, of, 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 the, of the time revolutionaries, as you describe them, on proxy evidence in, in the form of a stone tool for human presence. Um, and, and this is really mm -hmm. interesting. Obviously, you talk about how important that was and, and other kinds of proxies, in fact, like uh, drawings and, and photographs. Uh, and um, you say uh, that the stones don't talk, but they have a voice, which I think is a really nice way of, of, putting, of putting this. Um, however, in the book, unlike the lecture to explain to people, uh, you save the story of your own discovery of the stone uh, in the Natural History Museum until the last. And at that point, I don't know whether I should, I don't know whether mm. it's a spoiler to mention what you say there, but anyway, you give us a very tantalizing conclusion where you hint that this might not actually be the incontrovertible evidence it was presented as being. And you did rather hint at this in your, your talk. So, so I guess the question is, could you say a little bit more about that? But the question is, would it matter if this uh, was actually a forgery? Well, uh, the short answer is no. And Chris Evans uh, answered this for me when he pointed out that, that the whole thing is that what they set up was an experiment that could be repeated in other gravel pits in other parts of the world, um, partly because what they were discovering had uh, remarkable uniformity. And I mean, what you know, what we now call an Ashurlian hand axe uh, defies gravity by lasting for over a million years in pretty much unchanged form. Um, so uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I mean, just, just just to let the audience know, I've I've, I've had second thoughts about this uh, artifact. Uh, I can't prove to you conclusively that it was something that um, was stuffed into the section, but um, uh, it's very noticeable that they didn't publish it, uh, and they didn't even publish the section from which it came. Although the the reviewers of the Royal Society paper, which were Lyle and Murchison, so pretty high powered. Uh, wanted them to do that, but they but they didn't do it. Um, so it's almost as though they lost it intentionally. And what we have to remember there is that Evans uh, was seeing this material for the very first time. Uh, he became the great authority on stone tools, but in 1859, in April, he wasn't. Uh, he was a very quick learner. Uh, and by the end of 1859 and 1860, when everything was going off to the presses, uh, he was probably more aware of what might have happened. But then again, this particular implement, uh, they comment that it's not a very nice looking piece. And what they were after were pieces which could demonstrate the concept of design, because accepting them as proxies was based on the idea that it was the, the, the design was self-evident. And so you wanted symmetry, you wanted uh, uh, a nice shape. Whereas this thing looked as though it had been, you know, by the dog. <laughs> well, I think we might have some discussion later. I'm going to uh, finish my questions uh, with with two link questions about race. Uh, I think because this is the RAI, this is appropriate, but it also was came out of some of the images and uh, examples you talked about, and also that darker history you alluded to. So, so the first one is uh, that the book actually talks. Uh, quite extensively about debates over race and early human history in the 1860s. Um, now, although you say you're not 
using hindsight when discussing this period, it's very noticeable you take quite a, a clear line on the debate over anthropology and you're very critical of Hunt and the anthrop and anthropologicals. So I, I guess the question here is, does that criticism of that more, that particular version of racism leave uh, the racism of Victorian liberalism untouched? Uh, how, how do you read Lubbock and Taylor in hindsight? What, 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 where do you place them, say, in current debates around ideas of race and their legacy? Well, it's, um, yes, I, I, I must admit, I, I kept the lid on that particular dustbin. Um, uh, I mean, Hunt is so clearly uh, completely obnoxious that it's, uh, the, the, you know, he damns himself. Um, but um, uh, the others, uh, as Stocking and, and, uh, and, and uh, Tom Troutman uh, uh, pointed out and, and many others, you know, it is uneasy. I mean, Darwin himself is uneasy uh, from our perspective as to what they, as to what they think of, of race. Uh, interestingly, Huxley, of course, sees uh, Neanderthal as just a variety of human, not as a separate species. And uh, Darwin had, uh, I think, um, took a similar, or probably took a similar view. But yes, it's, it, it, is, it is difficult. It does, uh, it, you know, it, it, uh, Victorian views of race are uncomfortable territory for us all. Um, looking back at this particular time, uh, there are no kind of um, real winners. Yeah, I mean, I probably the... ducked your. I probably ducked no, your no, no, question. No, you I mean, everything you've said is, you know, consistent with what you've said in the book. But I think another way of looking at this, so this is the second part to this, is maybe just this idea of deep history. And I suspect you, there may be people interested in in discussing this in the audience. So this is my last question. Um, and, and that is that the debates over deep history today, uh, this is a massive topic and in the chapter seven of your book, so just to let people know because you didn't talk about it in your talk, you, you, you summarize later time revolutions if you like, you talk briefly about radiocarbon dating, other techniques which give ages to these chronologies and more uh, precision and so on. Um, and broadly speaking, you, you say that they both the time revolution of the 19th century that you're talking about, 1859, and the later ones open up the possibility of a more hopeful uh, universal history, which is quite an interesting phrase. Mm -hmm. So I guess the specific question then is, it, I have particular interest in this, and you can answer it in whatever way you like, but is whether those ideas of universal history go far enough, whether just because we extend the barriers of time chronologically, we can, for example, bring in other senses of history, say indigenous senses of time into a vastly extended chronology. And you'll know that in Australia and other parts of the world, there's a lot of interest in deep history and, and in thinking about the connections between, uh, if you like settler time or colonial history, indigenous history and how, and whether, I suppose my question is whether this very optimistic vision of what a universal or, or a, a deep time history can do is sufficient really to, to engage in genuinely with other conceptions of time, other conceptions of history and memory. I think that's, uh, yes, I think that's right. Now, that may explain some of the hesitancy uh, of anthropologists and archeologists of going into this area. Um, I, I, I agree. I think uh, as, a, as a colleague of mine, Rachel Krellin is, is, is arguing uh, about the ontologies, uh, is that what, we've, what we need is more narratives uh, and we need narratives that, that bring in um, different voices. And of course, anthropology is extremely well positioned to do that. And archaeology has also um, brought that in. Uh, what we don't particularly want is, is necessarily more um, Western views of how we got, got here. And, you know, I mean, there are plenty of examples of that around. So yes, um, time is going to uh, disappear into a, uh, into a kind of Spencerian complexity as we introduce these very um, different ways of, of conceiving of it and fold those into these narratives. That's a huge task, uh, and I'm, I, I'd be interested to hear from members of the uh, audience uh, whether anyone feels up to tackling that. I'm not sure 
I can. Um, but it, 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 but it does, it does lend uh, a, a, a huge. I mean, you know, let's be honest. This book was finished while Black Lives Matter started. I mean, you, you cannot divorce yourself from this. Uh, your earlier question about race uh, was taking place against the backdrop of the Indian Rebellion and the American Civil War. I mean, it was it was there. The people of Lancashire were starving because the cotton had stopped coming in. Um, uh, you know, all, all of these things were, were, were part and parcel of, of, of influencing those particular aspects. I think what we have to do as anthropologists, archaeologists, geographers or whatever, is, is, is uh, find a space in our narratives. Too often we've excluded, we need to try and be more inclusive. Variety is, is the name of the game. So Lubbock is right, uh, you do tend to find what you look for. That's, thank you very much, Clive. That's a lovely way of ending uh, those that phase of the questions. I, I'm going to hand over to David now, who's going to chair the next bit. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Felix, and thank you very much, Clive, for that, that, that fascinating I I I interchange. Um, so, uh, as we said before, um, please, please do raise your hand um, if if you would like to, um, and if your if your um, if your hand isn't always seen, one doesn't always see it immediately. On um, uh, on these machines, then you can always uh, bung something into the chat or to the question and answer, and we'll see. Um, uh, indeed, let's try and start with a raised hand here because I, I, I have actually succeeded in finding one, and let's try and, and um, uh, uh, bring uh, Rob Foley in. Um, so, Rob, you should be able to unmute yourself now, or you are unmuted. I think. Go ahead. Have I have I unmuted myself? I Hi, can Rob. hear you Hi, Rob, I, can't, I can't see you, but I can. Oh, lovely. No, I can't. Uh, yes, you, you probably can't see me. Clive, that was fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. I shall, I might even go and buy the book. Um, the, 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 <laughs> no, um, I, I would like, uh, since I'd like almost to ask you the question that, um, that Felix didn't, which is, uh, you mentioned so little about Darwin, but then it's probably a very predictable question from me. But the, the, the one I, really want to is I'm, I'm surprised that there was you stress so much that they were struggling to persuade people that these were designed objects because the you know the the Glyn Daniel history I learned was very much that that Freer had found hand axes and they were accepted when, when he published I think in the Royal Society no the Society of Antiquaries that these were ones so so in a way the the, the, the fight seemed to be about 50 years too late that was my question. Well, yes, oh. except, yeah, except, yeah, that's, it, it's true. I mean, uh, the hocks and hand axes uh, found in 1797, sent to the antiquaries, published with those beautiful um, engravings uh, in 1800, but then they were literally forgotten about. Um, they weren't referred to uh, subsequently, just as this uh, hand axe from uh, uh, Gray's Inn goes to Sloan and into the British Museum. So, um, it, and, and Evans uh, and uh, Franks, and Franks was a, was, a, was a man who knew his collections uh, backwards and forwards, both at the Antiquaries and at the British Museum. Uh, both of them uh, rediscovered these objects, spurred on by what, uh, what Evans in particular had seen in, in France. So there is this, there is this big gap um, uh, in which, um, things were known about, and of course it trundles on with um, Kent's Cavern and the work in Belgium and whatever, but it, it never really uh, hits the headlines. And Prestwich says uh, that he reckons that before they went to uh, Abbey in um, 1859, that there were only about 20 men of science in Europe who even thought of this issue and this particular question. Um, so uh, the, 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 the proxies could exist. So it, it wasn't really general knowledge. It, it should have been, but it wasn't. And part of why that was the case is, uh, is interesting. Perhaps if uh, uh, you know, people, uh, um, uh, the antipodes is, is, is just a case of you know, burying it, I think. Does that help? Yes, it, no, it does. I mean, I, 
it, it's such a puzzle. I mean, I can see, yes, things do get lost. I mean, there are many scientific examples where somebody finds something and it takes, you know, 50 years before the significance of it is taken. And indeed, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that comes through from what you're saying, which I'm afraid is sadly reflected in so much science, is how the establishment simply does not accept uh, anything uh, new for, and, until it's really forced down their throat. Um, and, and, and I think you know, this is another example. And, and I hadn't really, and, until you, you know, brought it to the fore, I hadn't really thought that this, this 50 year, this half century gap between Freer and <clears throat> Jada Perth is, is really quite a, a, a striking uh, puzzle. But anyway, yes. I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I mean you'd, you'd have someone, I mean, you know, Mendel, I suppose, is one of the examples of just having to be rediscovered um, and, uh, and and this 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 would be another one and that's why in that spinning plate diagram it was those uh, circles of friendship acquaintanceship science sharing of scientific knowledge these individuals were kind of at the center of the spin and they were able to to deal with it and uh, you know they were uh, Lubbock wasn't peripheral to Darwin's circle but Evans and Prestwich were through Lubbock they were into the most important scientific network that could exist at that particular time mm. uh, and they made good use of it and I think they knew they were using that um, and uh, that's why convincing the uh, Royal Society and the antiquaries was absolutely crucial probably convincing the Royal Society was more important, uh, and it was just a, it was you know very soon a done deal. Thanks. Yes, the suppression of knowledge is is very interesting. That, that volume that Robert Proctor uh, uh, edited on uh, agnotology, the cultural construction of ignorance, yeah. where yeah. things are uh, known about uh, but we hide them, is. Uh, um, uh, he, he's written very tellingly about the tobacco industry, suppressing knowledge uh, willfully. Yes, um, and the less but willful, uh, it comes out time and time again. Yeah. I mean, platonics would be another example where you know the the, the, the gap between its, its yes. first yes. proposal and when it when the, the geologists, who of course you make great heroes, but when later geologists you know caught up with plate tectonics, you know, there was a big gap. Anyway, thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Can I ask a related question, Clive? So, so Thanks, um, Rob. Uh, did, did, can we talk about, about the translation between looking at objects in situ in section? Can we translate from that and say, or transpose from that and say that this is the beginning of stratigraphy as a methodological tool? Or do we have to place stratigraphy as actually affecting the methodology of archaeology later still? Oh, I think, no, stratigraphy, stratigraphy comes earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Archaeologists, under the influence of geologists, are um, observing stratigraphy before this and, mm. uh, and drawing it and publishing it. I mean, even Boucher de Pet, the Gobamouche, um, does actually draw those sections and shows very clearly where he uh, found the flints and where they come from. And he's well aware that uh, stratigraphic relations like that are important to his case. He doesn't just present the artifacts as would have been the case at Hoxton or at Gray's Inn, where they kind of come out of nowhere, although we do know something about their uh, context. We don't have the detailed stratigraphic drawings um, from the early 19th century that we would be getting during the 19th century. Mm. Well, thank you. That's that's very helpful for me, and it's it's good that you mentioned the the, the French side because we have a question from Simon Boutot, um, who says uh, uh, most but not all of the heroes in your wonderful book are British. If a French author had written on the same topic, how might it have differed? <laughs> well, Simon, I think um, I think it would uh, I think it would start with Boucher de Pert and end with Boucher de Pert. Um, and he would have invited in these uh, English visitor guests to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, see his uh, work. But it, it's something that, that Felix was saying, um, and which is, I, I think, absolutely important, which was, it was seen as a great collaboration between French and uh, English or British science. Um, and they, 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 they did work together. The, 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 Evans and Prestwich did not try and drape 
the Union Jack over this piece of, of work. Uh, this wasn't a successful vaccination, which then becomes, you know, invented by a particular country. No, this was something that belonged to all mankind uh, and uh, was, was presented as such. And they are scrupulous, uh, as is Darwin in 1871, of giving credit to Boucher de Pert uh, and putting him uh, center stage. Obviously, the, uh, a, 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 a story told by the French would be very different. And I think the, the whole interest in Moulin Quignon, where uh, Boucher de Pere claimed he had found human remains in 1863, and this had to be disproved um, by the uh, English uh, geologists, um, would, would be very interesting. Although uh, our French colleagues have done an excellent uh, 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 a reanalysis of all of that uh, material, but it would be very different. It would be very different. There'd be, a, I mean, each country would have a different set of heroes, but you would still have to have Evans and Prestwich in there somewhere. <laughs> oh well, there we are. And, and, and John McNabb um, um, has written a question here, and he says, uh, "Just to play devil's advocate, I wonder if there is a danger in replacing one grand narrative with another. They are so easy to hijack and bend to particular agendas and viewpoints." Uh -huh including those of our political leaders. Uh, perhaps the fact that archaeologists are not writing uh, these grand narratives says something. Um, should we be writing small histories? Well, I think we do, Mac. I think we do write um, the, the small histories, and I think it's what we feel most uh, most, most comfortable with. Uh, and it is, uh, it's always uh, uh, disappointing to see grand narratives being taken in directions where they shouldn't be taken. Um, but, uh, but then I've, I find it equally disappointing uh, that uh, um, we don't seem to be in control or, or having a contribution to that um, in, 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 in many shapes and forms. So what I'm hoping in making deep history uh, is that by telling the story, we kind of get back into that way of thinking about uh, what 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 might take place? Of course, we don't want to um, uh, write the universal histories of Prince Albert or uh, even of John Lubbock, but we uh, we we do. I think it, I suppose it comes down to a question of relevance and whether we are more relevant if we have uh, if if we're participating in these grand narratives than if we're not. But point taken. Thanks for that question, Mac. Hmm. And, and there's a related one here from an anonymous attendee um, saying, can ideas of continuous progress be dangerous when shaping current perceptions of modern culture and our place in the world as, as, as humans? Is it the responsibility of uh, deep history researchers to question such narratives? I'm not sure I quite understand. Uh, 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 an element of continuity, the, 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 the question uh, would rather have uh, ruptures or like a saltation, a sort of Stephen Jay Gould um, sudden advance rather than continuous progression. I think there's plenty of evidence for uh, different uh, rates of change, definitely, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, gradualism uh, is a large part of the answer, but it's not the total part of the uh, of, of, of what we know as archaeologists uh, might have taken place. I think I need a little bit more fleshing out on that question, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yes, I suppose, is, is progress possible at all, I guess, is, 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 is one underlying point. I suppose one could argue that progress has certainly taken place in archaeology. Um, um, can we just well, leave phrasing? I mean, I mean, progress is clearly, uh, you know, is there. I mean, I'm very glad that I live in the 21st century with dental care rather than in, you know, the medieval period with none. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, if, if that's a measure of progress, then I'm I'm in the right century. Um, but as I show in the book, uh, there are two illustrations there of uh, travellers on the train, and what what one lot are in first class and the other lot are in third class. It's difficult to see those in third class as part of the journey of progress that the ones in first class clearly see themselves as, uh, as, as participating in. Um, so I think uh, progress is always going to be something that's highly relative in, in that respect. It sort of goes with 
history for the history is written by the winners. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. And now we have a number of um, hands up, so we'll, we, we should be able to get, get, get to everybody. Uh, although, please in, indicate, continue to indicate if you would like to ask a question. But firstly, we now turn to, to John Gowlett. So, John, I shall put, so try and bring you uh, uh, into the um, picture. And uh, you should be able All to right. talk now. I've just unmuted, so uh, it's live. Wonderful. Hi, John. Wonderful. I have the book in my hands at this moment, and I, I must say it's uh, beautifully produced by OUP to do full justice to your ideas. My question was, well, when David said Clive will speak first, Autotext managed to render that as the Bible will speak first. Um, which we learned, <laughs> which we learned that it did, um, until, as you show us, geology uh, got there. Um, and then in the book, you uh, you talk about the varied uh, responses of the church, I, 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 the, which is the Anglican Church, I, I assume. Um, so it was interesting that it's so varied. And the question really uh, was. Did in some way the Roman Catholic Church uh, find it easier to become happier with all, all these ideas? Um, and how much did, did these geologists don't care about uh, this aspect of sec uh, secular life versus church life? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, it, the, the Roman Catholic Church in France really did embrace it. So by the turn of the 20th century, you have that hugely important figure, uh, Abbe Broy, who is essentially a, a full-time Paleolithic researcher paid for by the Catholic Church. And he's finding cave art and uh, he's looking again at the Somme and reinterpreting the Somme uh, very much in terms of um, uh, simple to complex and whatever, but now using full terrace chronology from the from the, the, the geology. So I think it is a different story in uh, France. Uh, the other key figure is, of course, uh, Gabriel de Mortier, who uh, writes the big book in, uh, to go along with the Paris Exposition at the end of the 1860s, in which Jacques, uh, Jacques Boucher de Pet's collections figure prominently in the, um, in, in the uh, Hall of uh, Industry and Labor. Uh, at that exposition. And he, of course, is violently anti-cleric and has had to spend time in exile because of his, uh, his views. But uh, it seems, as Natalie Richard points out, that for the French, which is a very different uh, taking than the English, for the French, this idea of deep history is actually very firmly rooted in, in French identity. Whereas in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the UK, it isn't. Uh, we don't celebrate Swanscombe, for example. I, I, I think an opinion poll <laughs> wouldn't find too many people knowing what Swanscombe was. Um, whereas in, in France, uh, uh, they all know about uh, the Dordogne and, uh, uh, and uh, the Vézère and, and so on. It's, it's absolutely vital. Uh, in, uh, in Amiens, they have that wonderful uh, Jardin d'Archéologie, where you can go and visit these sections and actually get your own impression of time and space. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and it's all, uh, it's all laid out. Uh, Boucher de Pet has his own museum. Evans and Prestwich don't. Um, uh, Boucher de Pet had a, had a statue uh, <laughs> in Abvi. Uh, he's sitting there gazing at... Uh, Get, get gazing at uh, his uh, hand axe. Unfortunately, Rommel's army destroyed it in uh, 1940. But, you know, it was there, the state and the town uh, celebrated these people. Uh, so I, I think in answer to your question, uh, Catholic Church was um, generally much more relaxed about it and kind of took it, up, took it over uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, so you have Tyre de Chardin, uh, you have lots of abbeys uh, digging things up. Uh, they're, they're the ones that dig up the, um, the two abbeys who dig up the important skeleton of Chapelle-Usson, uh, a Neanderthal 
a buried Neanderthal in 1908. Uh, the French are very much in there. Uh, the English, not really to that extent. Mm, very interesting, thank you. Oops. Unmute you. I think it's Thanks. all right. Am I in? Am I in now? Hi. Um, sorry, I was I wasn't uh, hearing you, David. Um, this is yeah. This is Dan Smell Clive. It's really great to see you, and thanks um, for oh, this. Oh, hi Dan. Hi Dan. Long time no see. Really brilliant. Um, yeah, and, and thanks to Felix and all of you as well for arranging it. I just wanted to follow up. This is more of a comment than a question, but I just wanted to follow up a point that um, Felix had raised in talking about um, indigenous concepts of time and what you had said about a certain amount of hesitancy. Um, so we haven't been in touch for several years. Um, so just to fill you in really quickly, I've been I, I've been um, collaborating with colleagues in uh, in Australia in a number of collaborations over a few years, and it's been a, both a really exhilarating and a humbling experience, I have to say. And I've learned a lot um, about a lot of these issues that you and Felix had just raised. Um, I, I, I think what I would say is that if there's enthusiasm, it's an enthusiasm that is very cautious and hesitant. Uh, and what I've been interested in is yeah. learning reasons for the hesitancy. Um, and some of that has hesitancy uh, comes from John's, uh, John's comment about this fear of universal history, that this might become a platform for the return of universal histories that always flatten out indigenous histories. Um, it's a uh, completely legitimate um, concern. Um, as you know, from our, our own deep history volume, we, we were very much pr promoting mm -hmm. little histories rather than the big one. Um, but uh, I've seen people who have assimilated it easily to these really universal ones. And it's just a slippery slope that's very, very hard to avoid. Um, the other one, which perhaps does brush on a question you might answer, um, it, it goes back to the very start when um, you introduced your, your book as following the linearity of time as the way in which you're going to represent time, even though you know that in some sense it can also be understood as folded. Uh, one of the real concerns here is that European linear time is seen as an instance of a larger form of epistemological colonization. Namely, it's a type of epistemology that once again overrides indigenous epistemologies and renders them invisible. Um, so that is the reason for this really, really important hesitancy. And I, like you, I don't have any solutions either, um, other than the fact that we all need to talk about this. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Dan, thanks so much for those comments. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it is it is hesitancy. You know, there, there's a part of me wants to write such a book, but part of me says, no, you can't. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's time is gone in in, in, in that sense. So it, it's, it's trying to find another way of, uh, of, of, uh, of writing that sort of history. Um, so I think that's right. I, I think what we need is, you know, deep history mark two. We need to go back and, and explore. And I think one, uh, I mean, what we didn't have in, in the deep history volume of 10 years ago, would you believe it? Uh, but, you know, we, we didn't have the indigenous voice in that. Uh, deep history 2021 would clearly have to have that, that indigenous voice to give it uh, uh, a much needed uh, sense of, um, uh, of breaking down these rigid structures of time. Absolutely. No, no, very good. Thank you for that. Well, well, well thank you very much. Um, but also Nick Ashton had his hand up and I, I'm hoping I'm to, to now uh, facilitate things. Um, Hi, can you hear uh, Please go ahead. Hi Clive, uh, thoroughly enjoyed the uh, talk, Clive's a bit late, but I'm enjoying the book at the moment, so thank you very much for that. Um, I really want to go back to Sir Hugh Faulkner, um, um, you obviously talked about him and Felix mentioned him, and um, it's really the relationship between him and the others. He, Hugh always seems to, or Uncle Hugh as you call him in the book, he always seems to be a step ahead, yet missed out on the main limelight when it actually happened. I was intrigued by him obviously been um, yeah. in the Somme a year previously with his um, niece 
And, you know, what, whether he'd actually seen hand axes in situ or whether he'd been told about them and was con convinced by that evidence. But why wasn't he in a position to say, right, here we have the evidence? Um, was it because he didn't see it or did he not have the authority to make that pronouncement? Yes, good question. He didn't see anything in the field. He only saw in November 1858, he only saw the collections in um, uh, Boucher de Pert's uh, museum. So I think that was part of it. And he, he always deferred to his friend, Joseph Prestwich on issues of the geology of the, of the drift. He wanted, uh, he, he recognized uh, Prestwich as having the authority. And so I think he just felt that case would be, would be best. I mean, he was on his way to Sicily um, mm. in order to get to the sunshine for health reasons. So he wasn't going to linger long, uh, but there, and you're absolutely right. He was ahead of everyone. I mean, he was at Brixham very early along with yeah. Gengeli yeah. and then Prestwich joins them and all those sorts of things. He's, he's very much yeah. a pioneer. Uh, as he comes back from Sicily, they call into Florence and they, 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 they meet Mary Somerville. They go round for tea with Mary Somerville. <laughs> and he starts describing to her what has been found on the Somme. And uh, uh, that, can only, that is, I, I haven't found the correspondence, but it must be that Prestwich has written to him and told him what they discovered and which he hasn't yet seen. So he, he is behind the curve when it comes to that. And I think that that, that is part of the rage which he has against Lyle when he accuses Lyle of plagiarism in 1863, uh, which is he feels Lyle has pushed both himself and Prestwich aside and claimed the discovery of human antiquity. Lyle, of course, bats this aside, but, um, uh, but, the, but it sticks. And you know, it, it's a, a huge public spat, which really upsets Darwin's circle considerably um, but uh, but uh, so he's 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 there but he's he's a very generous scientist in that respect he wants the acclaim for Prestwich but mm. he's happy to step back himself but he likes to get things moving yeah yeah uh, he's an incredible person and uh, sadly he died a few yeah. later didn't he? He definitely deserves a biography mm. Mm. Yeah. thank you and curiously enough, curious enough, just having mentioned about uh, there's no museum for Prestwich and, uh, and Evans and so on, there is a there is a Falconer museum in Forres up in uh, up in northern Scotland, which oh, I right. haven't been to, but which uh, is is on my is on my to do list once we're able to travel north of Barnard Castle. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you very much for your, for your question. But could I ask you a little bit more about the, the way that nationalism and archaeology fit into all this? Because it seems to me that with the emergence of the schools and institutes abroad, with the French school at Athens already uh, um, um, almost at that time, only a little bit later, and, and, and other myriads of schools which started emerging everywhere, that we are seeing a kind of a, of a, of a nationalism. Could we say perhaps that nationalism and archaeology affects the classical world more than the more than the prehistoric world that you're talking about and I don't know whether that would be fair or whether you would have a different stance on it. Well I think it comes back uh, to John's question um, in, 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 in France you know it is it's part of la gloire is is this deep past and this um, paleolithic uh, past Whereas I, I, I would draw a contrast, and I, I do that in the book, um, whereas what the British sees on is, is, uh, uh, is that the Paleolithic very rapidly supports their uh, imperial ambitions. And so, you know, the, the, the Paleolithic really is the imperial Paleolithic. Uh, very soon after, as, as my good friend and colleague uh, uh, Padaya in Pune in uh, India has written extensively about uh, Bruce Foote, who found a Shirley in hand axes and started sending them to Lubbock and to um, Evans in the early 1860s. Uh, so very soon, uh, the, the, the experiment of the Somme was replicated in India uh, and then throughout Africa. And 
this this chimed very well. So you you ended up um, with with a vision really, which was that the uh, the Paleolithic was like like the British Empire, the sun never set on it. It was, it was, it was, it was global, uh, uh, particularly if you uh, included, um, as uh, so many 19th century anthropologists did, if, if you started to see, uh, you know, the um, uh, indigenous peoples of Australia as uh, living representatives of uh, a Paleolithic era. So it was either stone tool proxies or living representatives, and the British were very happy with that. Mm. Well, thank you. That's that's an absolutely fascinating answer. Um, and and uh, I think we've got a, we've got time just for for, for one or two uh, little questions more. And then and a further anonymous attendee hopes that you can answer something which may relate more to your previous work. But, I, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's an interesting question. He says, um, has your viewpoint on recognizing individualism uh, in, uh, in the earlier Paleolithic record changed over the last 20 years with the advent of scientific methodologies? Oh, dear me, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Um, we've got a great deal more information about uh, tracing the uh, hominin um, individual. Uh, but I think actually I've learned more about that by approaching it from a theoretical point of view rather than an evidence-based uh, point of view, or at least theoretical first. And I, I, I learned a lot about um, uh, hominin individuals by working through the uh, Social Brain Project with John Gowlett and with uh, Robin Dunbar where we saw how people interacted and why they interacted uh, and how bonds were so important and how people increased the strength of those bonds. And having seen that as, 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 as a, a, a develop, developmental line within um, human evolution, it was then possible to go back to the archeology span and see particular types of archeology span that would increase the signal behind those bonds. John's uh, writings about fire, for example, looking at kinship, kinshipping, uh, was also part of that uh, part of that uh, argument. And with that, this kind of monolithic um, individual starts to break down, and we start to see agents appearing, uh, and much more active and much more interesting uh, than uh, than even. Um, uh, 10 or 15 years ago that I, I was looking for. So I, I think I've approached it that way and seen it that way. But this is what fascinates me about making deep history, that here I am talking about individuals because it's 19th century and we know lots about them. And, you know, we even, um, you know, uh, and, and that's there against this huge anonymity or supposed anonymity of uh, the deep history and the Paleolithic. And what I'm hoping to show in this book is that, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they may not speak, um, as, as Felix re reminded us, but they, uh, they do have a voice. And it's, it's our job as archaeologists to give them that particular uh, voice. Uh, and uh, uh, then we can start to see a much more productive deep history uh, than previously. Well, thank you. That, that, that's a, a wonderful summary. Um, Felix, you, you, had, you had another question, I think. We're almost out of time, but there is time for you to ask your last question. Well, it was more of a, of a comment on from Dan's point. Uh, it links to what's just been said as well, which is uh, that maybe in the UK we could have more conversations between historians and archaeologists, that particularly around deep history of, of a kind that are happening in Australia with, with reference to indigenous history as well there. Um, but I certainly think we could up our game in the UK in getting archaeologists and historians in the same room. I mean, after all, they were in the 1860s. Um, so uh, that's one of the ways, that's one of the challenges, perhaps, that the discussion around deep history and the Anthropocene poses to disciplines, doesn't it? So although, Clive, you've said you're not an historian, I actually think you are. Um, um, and it's a matter of getting the historians as I say, and the, and the archaeologists uh, together. So, so thanks very much. I think actually your book is a fantastic provocation to do exactly that. So that's it. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. And would you like to have a last word, Clive? 
Well, I would. I'd just like to thank everyone for um, sitting through the last two hours. Thanks very much. And it's been good to see many old friends popping up there with uh, some lovely questions. So thank you. But I'd also like to thank the, um, uh, first of all, OUP for uh, uh, shepherding this book through to completion during uh, lockdown and COVID. And uh, the whole editorial team led by Karen Wraith has just been tremendous. So uh, thank you uh, to everyone, to, uh, to uh, Jessica Jones and everyone uh, for all of that. Uh, and uh, in particular to you, David, and to the uh, RAI for organizing this format. It's been great to participate and uh, thank you so much. Not at all, not so it's a pleasure. And thank everybody for joining us. And maybe Hanina and Amanda would like to pop up and just say goodbye to our, our visitors. Don't forget yes. you can join the RI as a fellow if you'd like to and look forward to more conversations. But anyway, it's goodbye from uh, me here. Hi. Hi, thank you everybody.